happy Super Bowl Sunday. I know Jim Tolbert's getting ready for his uh, big shindig today. <laughs> uh, that's fun. Well, Dave Carrick, one of the nicest, finest men I know, each year has gotten us Super Bowl game balls. These are the official balls that will be in the game today. And last year it helped us raise uh, about $10,000 for the class and for the ministry. And uh, so he gave me four balls. I got um, two placed for $5,000. And I've got two left. And it's a beautiful, beautiful ball. And I made a decision, Donna and I, that uh, what we'd like to do with this ball, because a game ball goes to one of the most valuable players. And this person's been on our board of directors for over 20 years. And Carol Haley, come get this ball in memory of Jim. In honor. Honor and memory. And he loved football. We would talk about it every Sunday. Come on up here and you can say something. Go ahead and say something. Well, this is a surprise, and he would love it. Thank you. We love you. That's good. By the way, on that uh, earthquake I saw on. Uh, Jerusalem Dayline this morning, Israel has sent $250, set up mobile hospitals in both Turkey and Syria. And these are Muslim nations that hate Israel. And they are one of the first to help when there's a tragedy like this. So pray for peace in Jerusalem. And as you know, Donna, I uh, grew up in a wonderful Jewish family. Uh, I loved her grandmother. She was the sweetest, godliest woman you'd ever want to meet. And this story reminded me of Dana, because she was just a, a great lady. And it goes like this. A grandmother was giving directions to her grandson, who had come for a visit. She said, you come to the front door of the apartment complex. I'm in apartment 14A. There's a big panel on the door with your elbow, push 14A, and I'll buzz you in, come inside. The elevator is on the right side. Get in and with your elbow, push 14. And when you get out of the apartment, you come up to my door, 14A will be on your left. Just push the doorbell with your elbow and I'll open it up. Grandma, that sounds easy, but why are you telling me to hit the, all the buttons with your el my elbow? And she says, you're coming empty handed. <laughs> <laughs> They had always said when you go visit, you bring something. And then I like this one. Having lost most of his hearing over the years, an elderly gentleman goes to the doctor to be fitted with hearing aids that promise him a hundred percent hearing. A month later, he returns to the doctor for a checkup on his progress. The doctor tells him his hearing is perfect and asks if his family is pleased. The man says, oh, I haven't told them about the hearing aids just yet. I just sit and listen to them talk. <laughs> Heck, I've changed my will three times. <laughs> and then finally, an old guy was working out in the gym when he spotted an attractive young lady doing chin-ups. 
He asked his trainer, what machine could I use to impress that young lady over there? The trainer carefully looked at the old gentleman, up one side and down the other. And he said, well, if I were you, I would try the ATM machine in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you take your uh, outline, we're going to spend this week and next week on First Kings, and we'll finish that book. Uh, today, we are going to study chapters 19 and 20, and the picture here, you can see Elijah walking up to Elisha, and he put his mantle over him. Now that signifies a prophet in those days, what mantle he would be wearing. He had chosen by God to become a prophet who would one day take over for Elijah. And Elisha left his oxen and ran after Elijah. And then what we learned last week, the prophet Elijah comes on the scene performing miracles in the power of the Holy Spirit he is to return with Moses to encourage Jesus during the transfiguration described in Matthew 17. And the wicked Ahab and his evil wife Jezebel kill most of the priests. And the whole northern kingdom descends into darkness and satanic worship. But the power of God is greater than the devil. Keep God in your heart at all times, especially when going through tough trials. And I think of that verse in James 4, 7, he says, where you submit yourselves to God, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. And then praying for the nation. Connecticut used to be a great state. Now, it's still a beautiful state. I was just reminiscing about uh, going to school there in four feet of snow and a half hour walk between classes. I mean, it was really spread out, but it's gotten so liberal and it's all Democrats. And then the scripture, which uh, whenever I do a funeral, I always quote this verse from Corinthians. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Great verse to keep in your heart. And then page three, where we are. Elijah just executed all the satanic prophets. They held a contest. And the contest was all those seven, 850 prophets prophets had an altar. Elijah had an altar. His was soaked with water. And whoever could call fire down from heaven, the people that were watching, it was a great crowd. This was better than the Super Bowl. Fire fell from heaven, burned up the wood. He takes those 850 down by the creek and executes all of them. So he is trying to rid the land of this type of satanic worship. So where we are, chapter verse 19. Um, now Ahab was a spectator at this contest and he comes back to tell his wife what Elijah had done. Now she's furious. These Baal prophets used to eat dinner with her. She was, they were her favorites. She worshiped with them. So she is ticked. And she said, sends a message to Elijah and says, hey, if I don't make your life like one of those that you killed by this time tomorrow, may it happen to me. And when he heard that, he arose and ran for his life, Elijah was exhausted, he was terrified. And he went a day's journey in the wilderness and he, 
he did a poor pitiful me prayer lord just let me die i'm no better than my ancestors he's exhausted and he's drained and we said last week what vince lombardi said fatigue makes cowards of us all so he is scared and as he's sleeping under a tree an angel comes and touches him and said you've got to eat so he woke up and there's a cake baked on coals and water and the heat rested again the angel wakes him up again and says you're going to have a great journey you're going to have an experience now with god you've got to keep eating so he eats again and he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights now who else went through that of course moses on mount sinai and also jesus in the wilderness 40 days seems like some sort of cleansing number but he goes to Mount Horeb. Now, Mount Horeb is where Moses got the Ten Commandments. See, one side of the mountain is called Horeb. The other side is called Sinai. So it's the, basically the same mountain range. But he goes to Mount Horeb. And he goes in a cave and he's going to crash there. And he hears the word of the Lord saying, why are you here? What are you doing here? And Elijah is still complaining. Says, I've been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel. But I am on, I'm the only one left that's any good. And they seek to take my life. So he is having that pity party. And God's going to reveal two things to him. He's going to reveal his awesomeness and also his gentleness. So he said, stand on the mountain, Elijah, and behold, the Lord passed by, and there was a great mighty wind that tore the mountain in pieces. The Lord was not in the wind. He caused it to happen. And then there was an earthquake. And there was not God in the earthquake. He caused it. Then there's fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, a gentle, calming voice. This is how I know the Lord's speaking to me. It's a still, calming voice. Usually in the quiet of the night. But it's not frightening at all. And he says again, Elijah, after this, this big show that God put on, he said, I have been zealous, but these children of Israel have forsaken you. They've torn down your altars, killed your prophets, and I'm the last one. And they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, you've got to get going. Gary Kinder always said, the Bible isn't a no-no book it's a go go book go and do and lord said to him go to damascus syria is right next to israel and when you arrive you're going to anoint a new person as king of syria i'm going to put you to work not only in israel but in syria and his name's ahaziel and then you're going to appoint a new king because I'm going to take Ahab out. And his name is Jehu. And then you're going to anoint Elisha. Which we saw in the picture in the front. You shall anoint as prophet in your place. Because I'm going to take you up in a whirlwind, Elisha. You're going to be gone soon. So you're going to get these things done. And it shall be whenever evil people escape the sword of Ahaziel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes Jehu, Elisha will take care of. But here's the remnant. Remember, he said, I'm the only one in Israel. God says, 
I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him, by that he means singing praises to Baal. And there's a remnant in our country too. And that gives me hope for this nation, is that there is a remnant that loves God and loves Christ. I loved what uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders said after the State of the Union. The choice isn't between left and right, it's between normal and crazy. I thought it was a great line. So now he's going to anoint Elisha. I always find those names to be close together, but it's Elisha and Elisha. And Elisha means, that name means God saves. And he's out plowing his field. He's got 12 yoke of oxen. A baker's dozen of oxen right there. And he was with the 12th. And Elisha passes by him, takes his prophet's mantle, his coat, and puts it on Elisha. And he said he knew what that meant. He was being anointed as a prophet. He said, please let me go kiss my father and mother goodbye and I'll follow you. And he said, go ahead. For what have I done to you? I have anointed you. So Elisha turned back, took his yoke of oxen. Now this is how he earned his livelihood. So he's giving up everything to follow Elisha. And he slaughtered them and boiled their flesh. He made a huge pot roast and gave it to the people and they ate then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant now we're going to get into a conflict with Syria and Israel still going on today I mean this is 2800 years ago still happening today now Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad is the king of Syria. He reigned from 885 BC to 865. <coughs> so he was king 20 years. And the name means son of Hadad. Hadad was the Syrian god jack of thunderstorms and rain. That was an agricultural place. They had to have rain so he gathers all of his forces 32 kings now these would be like mayors they're leaders of certain towns and horses and chariots and he went up to israel and besieged samaria samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom jerusalem's the capital of the southern kingdom and he sent messengers to ahab and said, listen, pal, all your money is mine. Your loveliest wives are mine. You can keep the ugly ones, but all your lovely wives are coming with me, and all your children are coming with me. Now, Ahab was a bit of, I wouldn't say a coward per se, but his wife ran things. He was like an observer. She was the boss. And he said, oh, no. Oh, 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 no. I tell you what, I'll give it to you. I'll let you have it. And the messengers came back and said, well, that's not enough. Ahab, this Ben-Hadad says, I want your wives and children, but here's what else I'm going to do. I'm going to send my servants tomorrow to your house, your palace, all the houses in Jerusalem, including the temple, and we're gonna search your house. It's like the FBI is showing up. And they'll take whatever they want, whatever looks good 
in your eyes, which you like, what's pleasant in your eyes, they'll put it in their hands and take it. So we're going to ransack the city, pal. And the king of Israel finally calls for some advice. So he calls the elders in. And he said, we got a problem. This guy is looking for trouble. For he sent for my wives and kids and silver and gold. And, you know, I was going to give it to him. And all the elders and all the people said to him, don't listen to that and don't consent. We're not going to do it. They're not coming to my house and clean me out too. So forget it. So he said, messengers to King Ben-Hadad. He said, tell the Lord my king. All you wanted in the beginning I was going to do, but this ransacking I can't do. And the messengers departed and brought back word to him. And Ben-Hadad said to him, the, I love the way they phrase this, the gods do so to me. And more also, if enough dust is left of Samaria for a handful for each of the people who follow me, we're going to demolish the city. It's going to be gone. But Ahab's getting a little backbone here, and he says, the king of Israel answered, hey, don't let him brag before the fact. You tell him, let not the one who puts on his armor to go into battle boast like the one who takes it off, who lives through the battle. And this is funny. And it happened when Ben Hadad heard this. He and all his kings, all his pals, his mayors were drinking. And they're drinking at the command post. And he's cocky and he says, get rich, have another drink. We're going to go get these guys. And I wrote down my coaches used to say, you celebrate after the victory, not before. And suddenly a prophet approaches Ahab and says, thus says the Lord, have you seen this great multitude that the Syrians have put together? Behold, I will deliver it all into your hand today. And you'll know Ahab. He still hasn't given up on Ahab, even though he's been a terrible leader. That you'll know that I am the Lord. So Ahab says, well, how, how, how is this going to happen? And he said, thus says the Lord, by the young leaders of the providence, we're going to gather the youth of your country together, get them drafted, get them organized, and we're going to fight with them. Then Ahab said, but you know, who's going to lead these people? And the angel, through the man of God, says, you, you're going to do it. So he puts Ahab on the spot. And he put young people together. He got 232 leaders. Not a lot. And after them, he mustered all the people he could. Guess how many? 7,000. God said, I have reserved 7,000 that haven't worshipped Baal. And this is the army that he put together. So they went out at noon. And Ben-Hadad and the 32 kings helping him were getting drunk at the command post at noon. You know, they say if you're going to drink all day, you got to get up early. It's uh, not a good thing to have your commanders plastered before the battle. The young leaders of the province went out first. And Ben-Hadad sent out a patrol saying, hey, people are coming up from Samaria. I don't know if they're coming to make peace and give me what I want or if they want war, but take them a lot, capture them. We want to interrogate him. Then these young leaders of the provinces went out of the city and the 7,000 army followed them 
and they each killed the guys they were fighting against. And Israel pursued them, and Ben Hadad, uh, quite inebriated, escaped on a horse with the cavalry. So not only was he a loudmouth, he was a coward too, and he's taking taking all. And the king of Israel went out and attacked them as they were retreating and killed the Syrians with a great slaughter. And the prophet came back to the king and said, go strengthen yourself. Get your house in order. Get your people healthy. Take note what you should do. For in the spring of the year, that guy's coming back to finish the job. That was actually three years later. So Ahab has put together a pretty good size troop. <clears throat> the servants of the king of Syria said, hey, we got some bad advice for you, King Hadad. They're gods, they're gods of the hills. They probably knew about Moses on the mountain. And they're gods of the hills. So if we fight them on the hills, they're stronger than us like we did last time. But if we fight against them in the plain, surely we can beat them. So we get them down on our level. So do this thing. Dismiss the kings, each from a position. Put captains in their places. Get better leadership. And you'll muster an army like the army you lost. And we'll fight against them in the plain. And we'll surely be stronger and defeat them. And he listened to their voices. So it was in the spring of the year. Ben-Hadad mustered the Syrians and went to Aphek to fight against Israel on a plain. And the children of Israel were mustered together, well-equipped, given provisions, and they went against them. And the children of Israel encamped before them, the Bible says, like two little flocks of goats, there weren't very many of them compared to the Syrians, just like last time. And the Syrians filled the countryside. And a man of God came and spoke to Ahab and said, Thus says the Lord, Because those Syrians mocked me, they said, He's not the God of the plains or the valleys. He's only the God of the hills. Well, I'm going to teach them a lesson. Therefore, I will deliver this great multitude into your hand. And I wrote my Bible, God will not be mocked. He will not. And they'll know that I'm the Lord. And they encamped opposite each other for seven days. So on the seventh day, the battle started. And the children of Israel killed 100,000 foot soldiers of the Syrians in one day. They tore them apart. But the rest fled into the city. And I'm assuming there was a great earthquake because it says a wall fell on 27,000 of the men that retreated and killed them. And Ben-Hadad fled and went into an inner chamber to hide out. So now Ahab's got the victory. And it was from God. He should have known this. He should have realized it, capitalized on it. But he doesn't. And his servant said, look, <clears throat> they're talking to the hiding king. He said, look, we've heard that these... Uh, Israel kings are pretty merciful. They're pretty nice guys. Uh, let's let's dress down, put on sackcloth, ashes, and go out and perhaps he'll spare your life. We'll beg for mercy. <clears throat> so they wore the sackcloth and they put ropes around their heads and came to the king and says, your servant who was going to wipe you out says, Please let me live. Let me surrender. Let me live. 
And he said, is he still alive? I thought, I thought we took him out. You know, he's a neighbor, he's a king like me. He's not really his brother, but he calls him brother. Now the men were watching closely to see if there was any sign of mercy. And they quickly grasped at this word and said, hey, your brother will appreciate this. Ben said, dad. So Ahab says, well, bring him, bring him over here. Bring him up here. And Ben-Hadad came to him. And he had come up on his chariot and said to him, Look, I'm sorry I did this. The cities which my father took from your father, I'll restore. I'll give him all that land back, everything. I will let you set up stores in Damascus where you can sell your goods. He's trying to give him this economic uh, benefit to making this treaty. Just as your my father did in Samaria, we'll let you do it in Damascus. And Ahab said, I tell you what, sounds like a good deal. I'll send you away with this treaty. He made a treaty and sent him away. This was a big mistake. He was to be taken out and destroyed. He was to be killed. But now Ahab has unequally yoked himself with an enemy. And it's kind of like being nice to the Chinese today. Uh, doesn't work. Now a certain, this is interesting. This is a parable going to take place to uh, let Ahab know what a mistake he made. Now a certain man of the sons of the prophets said to his neighbor, by the word of the Lord, God wants you, hit me, strike me, please. Now I've never had that happen to me. Somebody come up and ask uh, to belt them. But the man says, I'm not going to hit you. You're my neighbor. Then he said to him, because you didn't obey the voice of the Lord, Surely as you soon depart from me, you're going to get killed by a lion. You've got to follow God's command. And as soon as he left him, a lion found him and killed him. And another man, he found another man. And he said, hey, hit me, please. He wanted to look wounded for this parable that he's going to teach Ahab. So the man struck him, inflicting a wound. And the prophet departed and waited for the king by the road and disguised himself. He bandaged up his head. And as the king passed, he said, Oh, King Ahab, I've got to tell you this story. Please listen. Your servant, me, went out in the midst of the battle and a man came over and brought a man to me, one of the enemy. And he said, guard this man. Don't take your eyes off him. If by any means he is missing, if he gets away, if he escapes, your life shall be for his life. Or else you'll pay a talent of silver. Well, these soldiers didn't have a talent of silver. That's 70 pounds of silver. And he says, oh, king, but, you know, while I was busy here and there, I wasn't paying attention, he was gone. The guy got away. This is very much like the parable the prophet Nathan told King David about uh, what he did with Uriah and taking his little lamb when he had the whole flock. And so the king of Israel said, well, you messed up, it's going to be your judgment, your life for his, or pay a talent of silver which you don't have, but you let him escape. And the prophet takes the bandages off his face. And he, the king recognized him as one of the prophets. And the prophet says to Ahab, Thus says the Lord, because you let Ben-Hadad slip out of your hand, 
a man whom I appointed for utter destruction. He attacked Israel twice. Therefore, your life, because you spared him, your life is going to go for his life. So he's basically giving Ahab a death warrant. And your people for his people, your people are going to be judged because of you, because of your action. And so the king went to his house. After he had a great victory, he goes home sullen and displeased and came to Samaria. And I said, I bet it was. You want to hear a prophet say what he said to him. And I wrote my Bible, uh-oh, trouble's coming. And so what we learned, Vince Lombardi once said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Elijah was physically and mentally exhausted, which can also lead us to despair and depression. God strengthens Elijah out Mount Horeb where Moses got the Ten Commandments. For 40 days and 40 nights, he works on Elijah to rid Baal worship in Israel. And then number three, this goes for probably all of us in the room. It is important in life to find someone to carry on with our work and continue the legacy which you have started. And I think of Moses found Joshua. And Elijah finds Elisha. Jesus had his disciple. The Apostle Paul had Timothy. One of the reasons Donna and I agreed to carry on this ministry is because we wanted Gary's legacy, Gary Kinder's legacy, for a long time. So that's our plan. Well, we'll open it up. Questions, comments? Super Bowl prediction. Supernaturally. I wonder if it was good from heaven. Well, you know, the saying is still very common today. It's like manna from heaven. You know, when you get a blessing that's unexpected, it's like manna from heaven. Anybody else? Carol? Yes, I'm uh, I know that we need to be thrilled to death to have this. I also know we need to be thrilled to death to have it to you, Roy Lambs, to give it to tell it to somebody. Boy, how sweet of you. We shall do it. Thank you so much for honoring I thought you'd want to take it out of the driveway and throw it around. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of both, too. So. But uh, we'll do that. Any other questions? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day and the lessons we learn through the Scripture. Lord, it's so vital to study the Bible straight through. It's uh, eye-opening. It paints the picture of how all things were meant to be and mankind's need of a Savior, a need for Christ Jesus to be our redemption because we don't do it in our own strength. We do it through his strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the blessing. I pray for the prayer request. And I lift up everybody in this room that you would guard their health, their strength, their family, and their happiness. 
in Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen.